Uh, most of us know something about a DC-3. Um, MMA had them on their flight line from 1945 through to 1960 something, the mid to late 60s. <coughs> They had eight of them at one stage. The DC-2. That's a photo of the Koima. <coughs> and of course there's a DC-1 which I knew nothing about until a couple of years ago when I started to do a bit of research into it. There were many, many thousand of those produced. Under 200 of those produced and only one of those. So where did it come from? How did it come about? And what happened to it in the end? I've put a timeline at the top here so that in five years you can see the progress of aviation. In mid-1931, America relied on aircraft such as this Fokker F-10 and the Ford Trimotor for their commercial aviation ventures. But one of these crashed in 1931 on a flight from Kansas City to Los Angeles, and on board was a noted sportsman. And uh, this, of course, got it into the headlines. And uh, Americans realized that uh, since the wing fell off, they'd have to do a bit of work on finding out why. And they discovered that the wood and glue weren't going together too well. And so all of this type, the Fokker, and the Ford Trimotor were subjected to very serious testing. They in fact had to come off the line for a considerable amount of time and the companies that were used for them were on their knees, they were just about going broke. <coughs> there was one aircraft that was in serious competition and that was the all-metal Boeing 247, which some historians say was the first airliner. I'm going to dispute that. But anyway, um, there was a problem. The problem was that there was a united conglomerate, and the united conglomerate produced the, well, they had the controlling interest in Boeing, and they produced it. And since there was so much trouble with the other aircraft, the wooden ones, um, the united airlines decided they'd take the entire production line from Boeing factories. So the other airlines in America uh, couldn't get a metal aircraft which allowed them to service their passengers. TWA was advised that they'd have to wait a year or more, maybe two, before they could get a Boeing 247. The United Conglomerate also owned Pratt and Whitney and Hamilton standard <laughs> propellers. <laughs> so they really had the, the game by the throat. Yes, there's not much left after you consider all that. <laughs> and so in 1932, after about a year of trying as hard as they could to make a quid, TWA management contacted five aircraft manufacturers uh, in America and said, could you produce us an aircraft because we're not doing too well with Boeing. Specifications put forward by uh, TWA were somewhat along that line, 10 to 12 passengers, etc. And there were other uh, restrictions, sorry, requests about single engine performance. <coughs> TWA actually asked for a three engine aircraft, and uh, Donald Douglas came along <coughs> and decided he'd produce a two engine, twin engine aircraft. Initially, Donald Douglas decided that it wouldn't be in his interest to participate in this because he couldn't see a hundred sails of his aeroplane. Yeah, a hundred. <coughs> Within ten days, he had a, a concept plan ready to present to TWA and with the, their go-ahead, they started work. Um, TWA sent from what we've seen, we'll order 20 of these, or 24 of these aircraft. The DC-1 stands for Douglas Commercial Number 1. So the first DC-1 rolled out in 1933, the middle of 1933. And so I think my maths is correct. Uh, 
I'd try that. Um, it was the largest commercial liner at the time. I think the, uh, the Boeing carried about eight people. You could squeeze 10 in. Uh, this was a 10 and you could squeeze 12 in. 700 horsepower and two engines made it uh, pretty good for uh, performance. <coughs> and that's the only surviving photograph of the first flight of the DC-1. It should have been a marvellous success. But it could have been a total disaster. <coughs> what happened was the carburettors fitted onto the aircraft in two ways, the right way and the wrong way with a symmetrical arrangement. And so the carburettors had been installed back to front and every time they pulled the nose up the engine started, every time they pulled the nose down the engines came back to life. They raised the undercarriage to try and get rid of a bit of drag. Finally the engines quit so in it went. Fortunately the wheels when retracted have half of them sticking out underneath the aircraft and fortunately very little damage was done. <coughs> the carburetors were easily fixed, probably a 10 minute to a one hour job, and so they were back in the air fairly quickly. TWA was impressed uh, with this. They flew uh, simulated flights in it, and uh, they put in an order for 24 immediately. What happened was, <coughs> with suggestions from TWA and from Douglas itself, they produced a modified version of the DC-2. And so production started on the DC-2, and that was towards the end of 1933. TWA's order of 24, Eastern Airlines wanted 14, and American Airlines 20, and others came on board for one, two, etc. here and there. So you've said that adds up to about 58. So Donald Douglas had about 60 or plus, 60 plus aircraft ordered before he got, it, got going. So he was very happy. Brian, did they make any of the ones? Only one. Only the one. The one. <coughs> So the handover ceremony of the first DC-2 took place on the 15th of September, 1933. Number of passengers, sorry? 14. That went up a little bit. <clears throat> so TWA had, by 1934, had the DC-2 on most of the troops. Seating 14 people had had room for a hostess on board, a toilet on board, and um, meals could be served, and uh, people could take a flight across America. And uh, this was the first time they could achieve that. In fact, they advertised rather heavily that the night flight across America meant that you didn't have to miss a day's business. You could leave San Francisco, and the next morning you'd be in New York, or vice versa. And so it came about, <clears throat> that the airlines could make a profit from just carrying passengers. They didn't have to carry mail and other things on with it. What actually happened to the DC-1? It was purchased by Howard Hughes, who was a major shareholder in TWA, and he expected that he would make some record-breaking flights in it. He had other interests that took his mind off it, uh, and so he didn't use the aircraft. By 1938, anyone that owned an aircraft was in a very good position because the Spanish Civil War was underway, uh, Hitler was rattling his sabre, and uh, people were interested in buying aircraft for any reason to move equipment, troops, etc. around. So that Viscount Forbes got hold of the DC-1 and uh, he sold it to a French consortium with a small profit, I suppose. And then it went to Spain, to LAPD, uh, Linus Aliaris Postano Espanola, or something. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it was used by the uh, Spanish Republican government uh, during the Spanish Civil War, uh, and uh, probably performed reasonably well. At the end of the Civil War, it flew 
the defeated government, government officials, to peace talks in Tours. Then it came back, LAPE became Iberia, the national airline of Spain. And while departing from Malaga one day in December 1940, it uh, suffered a prank and was totally destroyed. So that was the end, the very end of the DC-1. There's a comparison of scale of the DC-1 and the Boeing 247, <coughs> very similar, 14 aircraft, 8 to 10. 192 DC-2s were made. Most of you have probably, a lot of you would have read about the DC-2 that took place in the England to Australia air race, ran second without even trying. It carried passengers, made stops on the way to drop people off and pick people up, and still ran second. The only aircraft to beat it was the purpose-built um, to have in common DH-88. <coughs> As far as I know, six DC-2s were purchased in Australia and once again, people, the airline system in Australia was really doing no good. They were told to buy British and the British aircraft just weren't standing up to things. And so, um, Holyman, Adelaide Steamships, Australian National Airways got together <coughs> and eventually imported a DC-2. The first one was the Bungana. And so there's a lineup of the aircraft to grant again, the growth of them. That's the actual aircraft that took place in the McDonald's Air Race in into Australia, ran second. And this is an MMA DC-3, uh, of which they had eight, uh, as far as I know, by about 1965. Most airlines in Australia and around the world lived on DC-3s during that period of time. <coughs> So the Bungana was the first DC-2 to go into service in Australia. It was used initially on the East Coast and then on the Perth run. Uh, this was what Harry Baker used to fly on a regular basis across Australia. I think I remember stories about it arriving at Mayland's Aerodrome on a Sunday afternoon and it was picnic afternoon where the people of Perth would drive out to Mayland's and have a look at the Bungana arriving. You saw it? You were there? <laughs> Anyone else? See it at my You're the only one. Good on you, Eric. Are you the old one? <laughs> <laughs> and so by 1935, Douglas decided that they really need to move things ahead and they produced the DC-3. First flight on the 17th of December the anniversary of the Wright Brothers' flight, and uh, of course, the rest is history. Thousands, uh, 10,000 DC-3s were produced. Um, there was another few thousand produced under different names in different countries around the world. And uh, there you are, the rest is history. So that's the story of mainly the DC-1 and how the DC-3 came about. Thank you.